Jewish museums in Europe, I should mention in this introductory lecture, um, is only the introduction. In later lectures of the course, I go into the special situation of post-Holocaust Jewish museums in Poland. Now, from relatively small beginnings about a hundred years ago, European Jewish museums have experienced a huge growth in the last two or three decades, and there are now more than 50 of them, complete with their own professional organization. They can be found in almost every European country, from the Republic of Ireland to Ukraine and Greece. They're all different. There's a full range of such museums, more or less everything from the abandoned modest local synagogue um, turned into a museum of the local Jewish heritage, all the way through to purpose-built museums with relatively grandiose collections of what is called Judaica, or Jewish artifacts. Judaica, as collected by museums, is an influential definition of the Jewish heritage. Judaica is basically art history, and that's why it includes such things as illustrated marriage contracts, artistic hand-woven curtains used in the synagogue, circumcision knives, special hand-painted plates for different festivals, spice boxes used um, for the ceremony at the end of the Sabbath, special nine-branched candlesticks used at the festival of Hanukkah, and important works of art as well as ritual objects made in silver and gold. All these examples of Judaica come from the area of traditional establishment Judaism. But there has been a new movement which affected Jewish museums, which wanted to bring into Jewish museums items from the everyday Jewish world, paralleling, as I've said, the secular rise of secular Jew Jewish Jewishness. That actually got started with Holocaust museums, or with Jewish museums that have a Holocaust section of some kind. And so, along with the religious ritual objects of Judaica, you get a single showcase, or occasionally a room, with Holocaust artifacts of local relevance. And that would include things like wartime diaries, postcards written to or from concentration camps, which may have been donated by to the museum by local residents, wartime identity cards issued to Jews in the ghettos. Having such vernacular objects in the Holocaust section of a Jewish museum, alongside the ritual objects of traditional establishment Judaism, is in one sense fully understandable. But it's also part of a completely new trend of what to display in Jewish museums in general, which have now become influenced by the rise of the secular concept of Jewish culture. So it means the increasingly common practice that everyday Jewish life should also be represented in the Jewish museum. And this would include ordinary vernacular objects such as newspaper clippings, photographs of ordinary Jews, Yiddish language posters, advertising performances of Jewish theatre or film, um, simple present-day Israeli souvenirs, and modern Jewish fashions drawn from music, theatre, film, or dress, and other things which are meaningful to ordinary Jews. This is now what's called uh, in the literature the materialization of memory, namely memory that is embedded in or discoverable through everyday objects that have got meaning for people, whether or not they are ritual objects. They could be photos of ordinary people, or they could be also a ritual object, which is here because it's got a special story. For example, a spice box, which was taken to Auschwitz, but was somehow retrieved from there, and they want to tell you the story of that spice box. So let me restate the issues here in terms of a series of questions about what to display. Just three or four points. First, should a mu Jewish museum concentrate on straight theology, namely Judaism as a religion, or on Jewish social history, or on some combination of the two? The overall problematic is a classical anthropological one. 
How do museums go about representing a specific religion and culture, and what kind of narrative do they supply? Should a museum stress the traditional culture or its modern interpretations, or both? Does one show Jewish religion and culture in orthodox theological terms, that is to say, a religion uh, with its origins in the ancient past, fundamentally unchanged since the time of Moses, and thus with a basic permanent essence, focusing, for example, on the Shabbat and the major Jewish festivals, or on the laws of kosher food, or on Jewish ethics and morals? Or does one put the emphasis on Jewish social history, namely that the content of Jewish culture from country to country has constantly changed over time, and now also includes secular redefinitions? That's problem number one. Problem number two. How much emphasis should there be on internal Jewish diversity and interdenominational Jewish politics and factionalism? Must you have Reform Judaism and Hasidism and secular Jews all included in your museum, as well as the conflicts between them? Does one show the downside, namely show Jewish culture in a negative light through aspects which are not very popular today, for example, gender issues to show Judaism as a patriarchal tradition versus a presentation of Judaism through experiences of women? Which age group should you emphasize? Does one include both children and the elderly? Thirdly, to refer back to an issue I mentioned earlier, where to put the Holocaust? What do you do about the Holocaust? It's therefore part of a much wider set of problems. Many people would say that the Holocaust doesn't belong in a Jewish museum at all because it typecasts Jews as victims, and only as victims, um, or else that the subject is too large uh, to show it adequately in a Jewish museum. Do you include uh, anti-Semitism and pogroms? Or do you put the historical emphasis on Jewish social history, especially the good old days uh, when Jews coexisted peaceably with their neighbours. How do you do all this? Well, this is what this course is all about. There's a lot more that I could say about Jewish museums. For example, how far a Jewish museum um, aims or should aim to present a Jewish view on topics of universal concern, such as ecology or climate change. But I'd like to finish this lecture by mentioning just one other problem. In presenting a culture or religion that is essentially foreign to its surroundings, that is to say, a Jewish museum in a Christian country, does one stress similarity or difference? If you put too much stress on difference, you may end up defining the other culture or religion in terms only of their exotica to include all those things which are distinctive about the Jewish culture, distinctive Jewish dress, distinctive Jewish architecture, food, music, art and ritual objects, as well as, of course, showing distinctive Jewish theological ideas. Actually, the exotica approach is pretty common, where visitors are shown large displays of Jewish ritual objects, for example, to have a display of fine silver uh, and brass spice boxes or Hanukkah candlesticks grouped together in a single showcase. They certainly can make a strong display, uh, and the technique is used in more old-fashioned Jewish museums, especially in Central Europe and Eastern Europe. The other option is to stress the similarities Jews have with other people. This, of course, is now fashionable in interfaith dialogue, though it would have to show that Jews have multiple identities, not only as Jews. After all, most Jews nowadays dress like everybody else, speak the same native language as everyone else around them, they watch the same TV programs, and they go shopping at the same supermarkets. In that sense, Jewish culture is fundamentally hybrid and a fusion culture. Um, but under this rubric, I put down toothbrushes on the thing. You'd have to show that Jews also use toothbrushes just like everybody else. 
But then how do you display similarity and retain the interest of the visitor? You can't have a museum, a Jewish museum, which just shows toothbrushes, because Jews do use toothbrushes. Is that Jewish culture? Well, one solution is obviously really to do both, to include both similarity and difference. But museum curators usually take the similarities for granted and in that sense probably d present a distorted, unbalanced picture about Ju what Jewish life is actually like. But you can have a middle position, namely to show artifacts which describe the Jewish contribution to local society or local civic life, um, showing, for example, how Jews in effect bridge cultures, for example, between Poles uh, and others, and there are also occasional hints of an interfaith approach. For example, to, to show Abraham and show how he figures in all of the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, um, even if in fact he's got a different status in each of them. Holocaust representations are interesting. If they're good, they usually try to do both, both difference and similarity. For example, showing Holocaust victims as consisting both of Hasidic men with their black dress, black hats and their side curls, but also middle-class Jewish men dressed in ordinary Western clothing and looking very much like ordinary Dutchmen, ordinary Poles or whatever. The short answer to a lot of the problems and questions I've been mentioning is this. There are no universal solutions how to write Jewish history or how to exhibit Jewish culture. What Jewish museums actually do is usually influenced by the circumstances. For example, some Jewish museums, in the spirit of their wish to be seen as fully-fledged local civic institutions, especially if they're getting sponsorship from the local municipality, will regularly stage lectures, concerts, and other cultural events of a Jewish nature other Jewish museums, especially if they're not receiving such sponsorship, will be kept strictly locked outside the visiting hours. Now, although there are really some absolutely wonderful Jewish museums dotted around Europe, for example in Holland, France, Germany and Austria, especially in Prague and most recently in Warsaw, and although some museum curators do solve some of the problems that I've been mentioning, especially by including temporary exhibitions uh, on specific subjects alongside their permanent displays, it is unfortunately far from the case that curators everywhere have the cultural and especially the linguistic knowledge or the financial backing from their sponsors to take all these questions into account. And this is particularly true in central and Eastern Europe. Finally, one last uh, sentence to finish this uh, lecture. The overall problematic is a classical anthropological one. How do museums go about presenting this specific religion and culture and what kind of narrative do they supply? That's what we'll be talking about and analysing. But that's to introduce the subject about as far as I can take it in this introductory lecture. The course then goes into detail about the situation in Poland. Let me just uh, show you um, some questions which I have been asked to provide you with. Five questions and a short reading list um, where you might find something useful.